Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to come worship you in your house today, Lord. Pray for our Sunday school ministries and and the uh, hour that we have a preaching hour this, uh, throughout this day, Lord. Pray that you just bless it. Be with the pastor as he leads in God's grace and gives the word to say, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice you did up on Calvary for you. Uh, shedding your blood for gifts of our sins, Lord. Thank you for everything that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. <laughs>
How y'all doing this morning? Good. Everybody's looking pretty good this morning. Man, it's a pretty day out there, isn't it? Was it frost at your house this morning, Leroy? No, Leroy, you're in church now, okay. <laughs> this is Tad. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, it didn't frost up at your house, did it? Uh, well, I guess that'll all have to say nothing. Man, it's a pretty day. This is a... It's like Doug was talking about in his upper. This is a wonderful time of the year, and this this is really a wonderful time to be right here in this part of West Virginia. You, it don't get no better than this. And uh, I've been other places. It, this time of year, it don't get no better than this right around here. It's a tremendous blessing to be able to live here. Patty Fussy. Patty's going to Giles County. She's raised in Glenn. And she... When she has an opportunity, she tends to badmouth Monroe County a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but you know, I think she, I think I'm getting her broke in after four years. Okay. Uh, oh, one thing we need to talk about here before we start: our street ministry. They're having uh, this coming weekend is railroad days down in, uh, and we're we're going. Uh, you need to think about this a little bit and see if this is something that you might be interested in doing. If like it's on Friday and Saturday, uh, I'm going Friday, Craig's going Friday and Saturday, and, and how this works, this is a, you know, if we happen to get enough people together to where we would need a, a band, a church band, we, we got it. We got somebody to drive and we're situated. If that's something you'd be interested in, you need to let Craig know. If you've never been to railroad days, how many of you have never been to railroad days? Like, you think, uh, if you have an opportunity to go, it's a lot of fun. It's a kid thing. You know, you take the kids down there. It's not really that big. You can go down there and Craig Dalton will hold signs. Is that right? Hold, uh, yeah, probably back that track, hold signs. And the church at Nix. You going to have them? Yeah, I'll probably have them. All right. We went down there last year. Me and Patty went last year. There's a, there's a Baptist church from Nimitz. Um, Craig preached up there three or four weeks ago or something like that. Who goes down there every 
year and they get down there next to the train station and they hand out those John and Romans books, you know what I'm talking about, those little booklets. We went down there last year and helped them and they're going to be down there again and they can always use a little bit of help. Uh, so there's plenty to do and it's a lot of fun, you know, you can, you can go down there and pretty much saturate that place, which is what we try to do. We want to saturate that place with Bible tracts. It doesn't take that long to do it. You know, if you have three or four or five people an hour of walking around handing out Bible tracts, then you're pretty much, you know, you pretty much got it secured. Anyhow, if you decide you want to go, I got lunch down there, uh, two or three different places to eat. It's a lot of fun, particularly if the weather's pretty like this. So, keep that in mind, all right? You got any questions or you want to know anything else about it, check with Craig or Rodney and we'll get lined up and uh, try to go. Okay? Anything else before we start? Everybody good? Alright? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for allowing us to be here this morning and for this beautiful day, for this wonderful day. This wonderful place you've given us to live and the blessings that you've given us and we just give you the glory for all of it. Thank you, Lord, for being with us in this Sunday school class. Just lead us, have the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and show us what to do. I pray that we would be in your will. Thank you, Father, for saving us, for the forgiveness of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Alright, we've got a lot of stuff to do. Uh, first thing I need to do is take these, grab one and pass them around. Grab one and pass them around. Pass them all the way to the back. When you get done, just give me a, give me a prayer back there. Okay? Make sure everybody's got one. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians, chapter number one. Mr. Lester, it is really good. Mr. Lester, it's good to see you here this morning. Appreciate you coming. Uh, now, one more little thing we're going to talk about here while you're getting situated. Make sure you got one of those timelines. First Colossians chapter. Let me start again. Colossians chapter 1. I got a slow down a bit. I get excited. <laughs> you know, we had a. Uh, had an interesting thing this morning in church. We had a new piano player in church this morning. Uh, Abigail played for us, but Abigail's not a new piano player. She plays from time to time. Kristen played for us in church this morning and did a really nice job. Now, we were talking up here, and the reason we're going to talk about this for just a minute is, first of all, it embarrasses her, and I think that's funny. It's part of why. <laughs> but that's not, that's not the important part. This has a lot to do with what we're talking about in our lesson this morning. Kristen, you ready? Uh, would you mind explaining, telling me that this is me and you, okay? Talk to me. Now, let's talk to everybody here. Why did, you, why did you start thinking about playing the piano for church? Well, um, got? the first Sunday that we had before service, we didn't have a morning piano player. So, I felt kind of nudge, saying, would you play? You should have played. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who's doing this in those? I guess it was. Okay. <laughs> good, good. Now, Chris, you're all right. Just talk to me. Go ahead. <laughs> so, I ignored it. And then a few weeks later, Preacher Mark preached on the supper where everyone made excuses, including Tanya, for the Christian life. And he said, I don't know what excuses you're making to um, not serve the Lord, but say, for example, you want to play the piano, but you're too nervous. That was your baby. <laughs> <laughs> playing the piano, so you came forward and did good. And like I say, that's got that's important, you know, and that's got a lot to do with what we're going to talk about this morning. And we have talked about that quite often in here. Okay? All right. Uh, this paper that I gave you, this is a timeline. Now, let me tell you a little story right quick about timeline. This is just for, you know, this may help me some. 
as far as the order in which things happen. Now, you see the dates? All right? When you do timelines back in biblical history, and see, it's not just biblical scholars. This is historians do timelines, do biblical history. You take five different guys and you get five different timelines. Right? Now, the thing about it is most of them are pretty close, you know, within a year or two. This is not set in stone. You can go find something that will differ from this a little bit. But the dates and things are usually pretty close. Okay? So let's keep that in mind. This is not an exact science. The thing that we need to see, what we want to see from this, is the order here in which things happen. Uh, remember we talked about that three or four Sundays ago about uh, Xerxes and Artaxerxes and how they were in the wrong order. Right? This is the correct order that they should be in. This is the order in which these kings rule. Right? Uh, oh. See that word says Cambyses, C-A-M-B-Y-S-E-S. See that guy? That is Cyrus's son. He ruled after Cyrus for a period of about eight years. Didn't really do anything that amounted to anything, and has absolutely nothing really to do with what we're talking about. But you know, there he is. We want to understand that he was in there. Then comes Darius, who we're talking about now. Okay. Any questions? We've got a few more things we're going to talk about here about this time, so we'll do that in just a minute. Take the Bible and start the book of Colossians. We are in chapter 1, verse number 16. Chapter 1, verse number 16. This is our memory verse. Would you stand, please? Chapter 1, verse number 16. Let's read this together. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So I think you have to see that. Now, what we want to think about there for just a minute is the, uh, the sovereignty of God. You know? And we want to remember all things created by him and created for him. Okay? Now, take your Bibles, go back to the book of Ezra. Back to the book of Ezra, chapter number 5. Back to the book of Ezra, chapter number 5, verse number 1. Oh! I, I, just, I just had an epiphany. <laughs> All right. Ezra, chapter 5, verse number 1. God, how many of you all read the book of Haggai three times? Last week. Hold your hands up. One, two. Good for you. You know, Hey, and I went to Mount Airy yesterday, and I was in the candy store in Mount Airy, North Carolina. This is a place where people, you're sure welcome. This is a place where you buy candy by the pound. This is down here. Three, two, four. There you go, son. Candy by the pound. I got to look at the candy, and then I begin to think, okay, candy by the pound. How much does that Sunday school class actually worth in terms of candy by the pound? But we got some good candy. Okay, good. Good for you all. Now, what's in the home? Ezra chapter 5, verse number 1. Now, we are to the place where, and we did this last week, the work stopped. Okay? Now, Haggai and Zechariah came to the Jewish people and prophesied. Okay? And all of a sudden, the work started back up. Now, and what we talked about last week was how well the work was going. Right? These people tried to trouble the Jewish people. These, these Jewish people were working. They wouldn't even look up. I mean, they are, they are tearing it up. And everything is going well. Everything is fitting together good. Darius helped them. Satan was put to the side. I mean, these people were going after. And this all started, oh, let me back up one step. One thing we need to understand, and this is in terms of that time, when the Jewish people quit working on the temple, all right, they stopped, the work stopped, to the time when they started back up was 14 years. 
That's not like, it's not like it was three weeks. Fourteen years they didn't work on the temple. Okay? Then the work started back up. Now, look at chapter 5, look at verse number 1. We talked about this last week. Then the prophet, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Ido, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. These men prophesied, and the work started. Okay? Now, what we're going to look at today and the direction we're heading is what exactly did Haggai and Zechariah say to these people that lit a fire on them after 14 years to go back to work? Okay? That's what we want to talk about. Now, look at chapter 6, over in verse number 14. Chapter 6, verse number 14. It says, And the elders of the Jews building, and they prospered. They prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ida. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel. God said, we're going to do this. That's the commandment of the God of Israel. They finished it through the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah according to the commandment of God. And according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Okay, so now, we understand now that the temple's done, right? That this work went very well, right? So what we're going to do is back step here just a little bit and try to understand what these two prophets said to the Jewish people that got them going again, okay? Now put a little mark right there in your mind, verse number 14. When we get done and we come back to the book of Ezra, this is where we're coming back to, right here, Okay? All right, take your Bibles, turn to the book of Haggai. The book of Haggai, chapter number one. You can put that Bible ribbon in there on the post last week so you wouldn't have to hunt for it. Hey, good. Good, good for you, buddy. All right, Haggai, chapter one, verse number one. Now, let's talk about a couple things here before we start. All right? We are going to take a look at some Old Testament prophecy. All right? First of all, there is no way that I'm going to stand up here in front of you and tell you that I understand Old Testament props. Okay? Now, I don't know more about music. So what we're going to do is, in these minor prophets for a little bit, we just want to take a look at it and try to pay attention to what it says. Now, Haggai is only two chapters. Alright? Bible scholars say, and a lot of people believe that the book of Haggai is the easiest one of the minor prophets. There were 12 of them. This is the easiest one to do. They also say that the book of Zechariah, which we may tiptoe into here, the book of Zechariah is the hardest one of the books to do. Hang on, this guy's very plain spoken. Now that we know what's going on, we won't have any bit of trouble understanding this. He said, God said this. The Lord said this. God said do this. Right? It's, it's not hard to understand. So, we're going to kind of work our way through it and see what it says. All right. Okay. Chapter 1, verse number 1 says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month. Stop right there. We were talking about this timeline. You will see as we go through these books and these verses that, that the, the writers of the scripture are beginning to date their times by Gentile kings. Right? You, there are no more kings of Israel. There are no more kings of Judah. That's all done. These are Gentile kings in the sixth year of Darius, in the second year of Cyrus. Okay? So that's what's going on here, and they are beginning. Historians are beginning to pinpoint these dates. Now, this is not really important, but we need to kind of pay attention to this. We go, you see, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month. On our calendar, that would be September 1st, 520 B.C. That's what that date would say. Okay? Now, I read, I was looking at some stuff from another guy last night. He said, no, it's August 29th. It's not September 1st, it's August 29th. So remember, these days vary a little bit depending on who you're talking to. But, yeah, we need to kind of pay attention to that. Now, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jezedek, the high priest, saying, 
Verse number 2, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Okay, we got to stop right here. We, we need to get this fixed right off the bat. You know, 14 years, okay? It's been since they worked on this place. Now, the, see, Chris, here's, here's one of the excuses, John, all right? The, the Jewish people said, now I want you to think about this a minute. Remember the sovereignty of God, the creator of everything that we know, see, and the, all that, all right? Remember that? All right, these people said, it is just not time for us to do this work. That's what they said in that verse right there. They went to God and said, look, we'll be glad to do this, but it's not right now. It's not the time. Just like when you said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play the piano and it's not tomorrow. Okay? Now think about how silly that sounds. To go stand before God and say, I want to do what you want me to do, but I want to do it when I get ready to do it. Okay? You want me to do it tomorrow. No, no, no. The time's not right for that. All right? Now think about that a minute. That would be like the Holy Spirit convicts me about teaching his son school class. Okay? I say, oh, sure. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll be glad to do it. I'm all in. Ready to go. So, what happens next is the Holy Spirit begins to work. And this is what he did with the Jewish people, you know? All of a sudden, the preacher's burdened about me teaching his Sunday school class. He comes to me and talks to me about it. All of a sudden, we're getting all these new curriculum materials, and these books are coming in. You know, everything's getting in its place. Our Sunday school attendance is growing. So here I am teaching Sunday school class. I'm thinking, man, this, well, this, is, this is a wonderful thing. All right? About six months later, the attendance is down. The preacher's on my back. It turns out that this Sunday school curriculum wasn't worth five to start with. And I'm thinking, this is not what I signed up for. Okay? So, I go to God and say, you know, I'll be glad to teach that Sunday school class, but something's wrong. The time's not right. I got things I need to be working on. Right? So I'm going to do that. I'll get back to you when I think it's time to teach this Sunday school class. Now, do you understand how ludicrous that is? To go to God who created everything that we know and say, I'll let you know. Okay? <laughs> Which is exactly what these people did. And their excuse was, the time is just not right. Well, it hadn't been right for 14 years. These people had no intention of working on this temple. It's been 14 years. Okay? Now, look at what God says to them. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying, This is God. Is it time for you to dwell in your sealed house? That word sealed pretty much means panel. Right? These houses had panel in which at that time was amazing. These are nice homes. Is it time, O oh, ye dwell in your sealed houses, and this house, lying waste? Okay? So God comes to me and says, Really? Is that what you're telling me? It's time for you to work and do your work, not do my work? Is that what you're saying? Now, let's stop and think about this just a minute. All right? And think about when the time is that I'm supposed to do God's work. How many of you know what Matthew chapter 6, besides preaching, how many of you know what Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33 says? Come on, y'all don't know this. Come on, Andrew. Matthew 6, verse number 33, it says, Pray and seek ye first. All right, now you know. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And these things will be added to you. Seek ye first. Okay? Now, the scripture that we looked at last week, our, our memory verse in Corinthians, it said, abounding always. Alright? See those two terms there. Always and first. Abounding always in the work of the Lord. Now, these people were not seeking God's righteousness first. They were not abounding in the work of the Lord. They were making excuses and saying, we need to work on our stuff over here. Okay? Now, as we go forward, we need to wrap this around us. Okay? Now think about me. Okay? Think about me when God comes to me with these things to do. I need to work on this. I'll get to that. I need to work on this. That's not what the Bible says. Right? Now, look at verse number three. I'm sorry, verse number five. 
God says to these people, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Right? Consider your ways. Now I have to believe, and I truly, I truly believe this, and I think you do too. I have to believe that God, the Holy Spirit, is saying to me, right here, Dave, you need to consider your ways. Right? We have talked about more than once doing self-examination. Stop. I need to stop and I need to consider my ways. Okay? This is, that's, this is not, you know, there is no point in doing a self-examination of your ways if you are not going to be truthful with yourself. <coughs> I can walk around here patting myself on the back all day long saying, I did this, I did that. You know, you have to be, I have to be truthful as I consider my ways. Now, what he goes on to say, and if you've read this, you, you know this. What he goes on to say is he wants these people to consider how they're living. Right? And what they're doing, here's what those Jewish people are doing. They're doing their own work. They're not doing God's work. And they are kicking and scratching and gouging and trying to get by. The Bible says that they had, they had money coming in and it was like putting it in a bag with holes in it. These people were making good money. They were working. They were living in fine homes. And everything that they brought into their house, it seemed like it went out faster. Sure. Right? They couldn't keep up. There was no satisfaction. There was no peace. There was no joy. They kept wanting and they wanted and they wanted. It says that they, they drank and they drank and they drank and they were still thirsty. They ate. And they ate, and they ate, and they were still hungry. They put on all the clothes they had. They were still cold. They couldn't get warm. They could not get to where they thought they wanted to be. And they were working themselves to death, doing it. That's talking about me. You know, I know, I know, I've been there. And you have too. I know exactly what that's like. I can remember when my kids were little, little older. And, you know, you work as hard as you can. And you think, well, I, I might get that car. I want to buy this house, you know. My kids are in school. They need new tennis shoes. They cost a hundred bucks. And you just keep, you just keep working and working to the point where all of a sudden you think, you know, I'm not getting anywhere. That's what was going on. This is what God wanted these people to consider and to understand. When He said, "Consider your way," that's what was going on. That's what goes on with us. You I know that you understand what I'm talking about. This is not hard, okay? So, you get to the point where you think, hey, I just got to do something here. I got to do something to get this fixed. Now, the other thing that happened with these people, see, now remember, they're not bearing any fruit. Okay? They're working for themselves. They're digging and scratching, but they're doing it all for themselves. They're not doing God's work. They're doing their work. They're not the, the peace of mind, the joy, those kind of things. They don't have it. They're not bearing any spiritual fruit. And one other thing that happens, look at verse number 11. Verse number 11 says, And I call for a drought upon the land. Not only is God not helping these people, God's looking against them. They have come to the point where God is, is not with them. All right? He is the one that called for the drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine. That is the situation that they have worked themselves into, and God says, you need to consider this. And what he wants them to understand is that this is not working. The way they're living is not working. Okay? All right. We good so far? Wes, Will? Okay. Now, let's talk about me and you. Which is what we need to get to this. What we need to think about. When God looks at me and says, Dave, you need to consider your ways. Okay? And what I have to understand and what I have to get from this is, am I doing God's work? Is that, am I seeking the kingdom of God first? Am I always abounding in the work of the Lord? Or am I working on myself? Right? Consider your ways. Now, let me show you something. Take the Bible. Turn to the book of 1 Samuel. Turn to the book of 1 Samuel. We're coming back here to the Haggai. This is the book of 1 Samuel. Chapter number 1. 1 Samuel chapter number 1 and verse number 24. Chapter number 1, verse number 24. Okay. 
Okay, that's not the right place. Let's try Second Samuel. See how that works. Second, Second Samuel, chapter number one. Verse number 24. Okay. I'm, I apologize. I'm looking at this wrong. I'm looking at the wrong verse. Yeah, let me tell you what this verse said so we can go. All right. What this verse said is, and Samuel is speaking to the children of Israel, and he says that one thing that we need to consider is, now this is important, one thing we need to consider is we have to stop and think about the things that God has done for us. Okay? We have to stop and think about the things that God has done for us. When I begin to stop and think about right, the things that I need to do for God, right, first of all, I need to think about the things that God has done for me. Okay? i got to keep that in mind. And in my service, see, this is one thing that you think about when the Holy Spirit begins to convict you. And I stop thinking, okay, now am I going to do this work? One thing I have to remember is, what God has done for me. Okay? Now, let's see if we find this. Take your Bible, let's go to the book of John. Go to the book of John, chapter number 12. The book of John, chapter number 12. Verse number 26. Book of John, chapter number 12. Verse number 26. Okay. Let me make sure we're in the right place. John chapter 12, verse number 26. This says, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Alright, see that? What I've got to get in mind, what I've got to wrap my head around is, and this is what I really need to think about, is what God has done for me. Alright? Then when he calls me to serve, when he calls me to do his work, what he has done for me, and the fact that doing God's work is not supposed to be a burden. That's right. My relationship with Jesus Christ is in no way supposed to be a burden. Mm-hmm. Right? Kristen played the piano up here this morning. Is it, that shouldn't be a burden for her. What we have to understand is the privilege that we have to serve. That's right. Okay? Serving God, doing God's work, seeking the kingdom of righteousness, always abounding in the work of the Lord is a privilege. And if I serve Jesus Christ, God will honor me for it. All right? If I get up and come to Sunday school class this morning, all right, and I get out of bed in the morning, I think, oh, Lord, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this or not. You know, I really would like to, particularly with this early church service, it's eating me alive. Okay? I got to get out of bed. I would truly like to just lay in the bed. Call, I can call Corey right now and say, Corey, I'm sick. I, ain't, I don't feel good. You, <laughs> he would do Sunday school. Okay? If that's the attitude that I had coming to Sunday school class, then I just will be Cracker Barrel. And you all would be much better off if I was a Cracker Barrel. Okay? <laughs> See that? <laughs> being here and being able to stand up here in front of you and teach this Sunday school class is a privilege, it's an honor. And I praise God for allowing me to serve. Right? That's how I have to approach my service. That's what helps me put the righteousness in his kingdom and the things that he wants me to do. That's how it helps me to get that first in my life. Sure. I've got, got to get that right. Okay? It's not a burden. It's an opportunity to serve and praise the Lord for it. Right? Now, let's think about this just a minute. Go back to the book of Haggai. Back to the book of Haggai. Now, remember the situation that these people were in. God tells them next. He says, you know, here's why. You understand? You consider your ways. You understand the situation that you're in. Here's why you're in that situation. It says in verse number 9, You look for much, and lower came to little. When you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in waste, and you run every man to his own house. You are not doing my work first. You are doing your work first. That's why you're in the situation that you're in. Okay? Now, next thing he does, look at verse number 8. 
Here is what God tells these people to do about this. Here's how you fix this. Here's what God tells us. Here's how you fix this problem. Okay? It says in verse number 8, go up to the mountain. Now, go up to the mountain. In the Bible, when people went to the mountain, they were looking for God. They went to the mountain to seek God. They went to the mountain to find out what God had for them, to get closer to God. Moses went up on the mountain. Elijah went up on the mountain. Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain. Right? God expects us to, and he's telling these people, go up on the mountain. The first thing that I have to do to get this fixed is I've got to get my relationship right with God. I've got to get right with God. I've got to get spiritually right. I've got to get prayed up. I've got to understand what's going on. Once I get right with God, it says next, and take the wood, bring the wood. This is the wood that was on the mountain. Right? You go up there, you get with God, you get yourself right with God, you take the spiritual gifts that he has given you, and you go back down, and you go to work. Okay? That's what he is telling these people that they need to do. Okay? It says, and build a house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, save the Lord. Right? Okay. We good so far? Everybody good? And good? Right, we're about to finish it. Let me show you one more thing. Now, look at verse number 12. Alright? Verse number 12 says, It's Ruth the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua the son of Joseph, at the high priest. With all the members of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Right there, right there is where the work started back. This is where these people went to work. And he said, and the words of Haggai the prophet, and the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. What happened right there was, these people were revived. There was a revival went on. They got their fear of the Lord, the respect and their honor and the awe of God back, and they obeyed what God told them to do. So they went back to work. Right? Now one more thing. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. Now watch this. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Joseph, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Now, watch it. Here's where we'll finish. God through the power of the Holy Spirit, convicted these people about doing this work to the point where they couldn't get away from it. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get out from under it. All right? Now, this, this is conviction. All right? He convicted these people when the, when the local people came by. These people, these Jewish people, didn't even look up. All right? They just kept working, kept working. God says, I'm with you. Everything's falling together. But we need to understand this conviction, which all goes back to the sovereignty of God. This temple is going to get built. We see that. Right? And right here, he puts, he doesn't give them a choice. He doesn't come back and say, okay, now you're ready to start. He convicts them to the point where they just, they just do what he says. Right? Now, have you ever had that conviction? Have you ever been convicted like that? Right? Yeah, yes, you have. Yeah, you have. One time for sure. Now, see, Christian, here's this conviction. You know, God leaned on you, the Holy Spirit is pounding on you until you said, okay, I'll play the piano. All right, I got it. Okay? When you got saved, when I got saved, that is the kind of conviction that I felt right there. Right? This was God through the Holy Spirit leaning on me to the point where I said, I got to do something. Right? That's the conviction that he put on these people. It's the same thing. So you understand what that was like. Okay? All right. We're done. How'd that go? Fair. I hate I lost that Bible verse. I'll find that. I had it. I, I had it this morning. And I couldn't. Okay. I'll find it this morning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I know you should know this, but you're talking about something that makes you feel like an idiot. That's right. So if everybody said about it, you don't know what he's doing. Alright, I'll, I'll have it next week. I'll bring it in here. I'll have it. We'll talk about it. Right, next week, chapter 2, 
in the book of Haggai. Read chapter 2 in the book of Haggai. We're actually going to see some, I'm going to start talking about some prophecy. Okay? This is not hard. This is not, this is not, well, it's my prophecy. I don't know what to do. The book of Zechariah. That's, uh, I don't know what to do. You know, that's a whole different thing. But we'll get to it. You got anything else? Preacher, you got anything? You good? Everybody good? Ethan, you want to pray? We'll be done.